Hello, and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. When you're ready to launch your next app or want to try out a project you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so take a look at our friends over at Linode. With the launch of their managed Kubernetes platform, it's easy to get started with the next generation of deployment and scaling, powered by the battle-tested Linode platform, including simple pricing, node balancers, 40 gigabit networking, dedicated CPU and GPU instances, and worldwide data centers. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash linode today, that's L-I-N-O-D-E, and get a $60 credit to try out a Kubernetes cluster of your own. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of this show. You listen to this show to learn and stay up to date with the ways that Python is being used, including the latest in machine learning and data analysis. For more opportunities to stay up to date, gain new skills, and learn from your peers, there are a growing number of virtual events that you can attend from the comfort and safety of your own home. Go to pythonpodcast.com slash conferences to check out the upcoming events being offered by our partners and get registered today. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and, and today I'm interviewing Matthew Rocklin and Hugo Bone Anderson about their work building a business around the Dask ecosystem at Coiled. So Matt, can you start by introducing yourself? Hey, Tobias. Yeah, my name is Matthew Rocklin. Uh, I've been a longtime open source maintainer in sort of the Pi data space. So the NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, Jupyter space. Uh, mostly I think about scalable computing, so parallelizing that ecosystem, mostly with the library Dask. I've been sort of one of the lead maintainers of Dask for the last five or six years. And you're also CEO of Coiled. And I'm also CEO of Coiled. That's right. <laughs> and Hugo, how about yourself? Well, that's a wonderful segue into into me. I'm um, I run uh, data science evangelism and marketing, um, wearing a few other hats at, at Coiled, which we've we've just founded. Uh, my background is in uh, math, uh, research science, in cell biology, uh, and data science. And I've done a lot of work in um, data science e- education. I, I've I, I recently. Join code from Data Camp, where I, I built out, I, I suppose, um, foundational uh, Pi Data e- ecosystem e- educational material, and that's actually how Matt and I met around four years ago. We were collaborating with with, with Anaconda on a lot of uh, online educational content for the Pi Data stack. Podcast listeners will know Hugo from his previous podcast, Data Framed, where he was the host. Uh, how is it like being on this side of the uh, microphone, Hugo? I really, I really like it. I, I like both sides, but I, um, I like also finding a new audience and a new listenership and getting new feedback on the types of things we work on and uh, in, interested in. I gotta say, I do like asking the questions though uh, as well. So forgive <laughs> me if that happens at, at some point. If my curiosity gets the better of me. Yeah, absolutely. As somebody who's been on both sides of the mic myself, I can definitely relate to it's a very different experience being the person being asked the questions than being the person who's driving the conversation. Absolutely. And so, Matt, do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? I think so. I've been actually been on your show a couple of times. So I'm going to skip that question and instead answer how the first time I, I contributed a patch to Python. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, that was I was uh, I was playing around with SymPy a little bit. It's a sort of Mathematica clone inside of Python, and I uh, was a Google Summer of Code project. So Google Summer of Code is a great great program. They give you know small stipends or they give stipends to people to work on open source projects, and I did that. It was a great time and that they taught me how to sort of live in the open source world. And that uh, I stayed ever since. And Hugo, do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? Oh, I definitely do. So I did my grad graduate work in pure math and I'd done a bunch of applied math and I started my first postdoc or well, my only postdoc, it, it, it moved, but um, in Germany in a cell biology lab, ostensibly to do applied math and mathematical modeling became clear that a lot of my colleagues were dealing with very large um, data sets. And I'd done a bunch of programming bits and pieces around in, in the past, but I needed to you know, ingest, analyze, and reproduce scientific results on really large data sets that my biological collaborators were producing. And then I started self-teaching Python. And it was actually, I, I learned R and Python and worked in both at that time, but it was the advent of what were then IPython notebooks that really helped me so much along the way and helped me to educate, you know, in the end, hundreds of other people in in, in workshops at this uh, at the Max Planck Institute as well. And so, as we've already mentioned, we're here to talk about your work on the Dask project and the business that you're building on top of it. So, for people who aren't familiar with it, we did do an interview on the Data Engineering Podcast that went fairly in depth about Dask itself. But for anybody who hasn't listened to that or who isn't familiar with the project, can you just give a quick overview about what Dask is and some of the motivations that you had for building it? Sure. Yeah. So Dask is an 
open source Python library that comes out of the PyData space. It was designed to parallelize other libraries uh, like NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn. Uh, but it very quickly became far more general. And so today it's used by dozens of other PyData libraries for a variety of different fields, doing everything from you know, advanced machine learning with PyTorch or XGBoost to you know, GPU accelerated work with Rapids to you know, backing Django websites in the same way you might use Celery or you know, backing Airflow or Prefect. So Dask is sort of now like a general purpose distributed computing platform that's very Python native. It's pure Python under the hood, it's a Tornado application. So yeah, it helps you run Python. At scale. And I might just build on that by saying, uh, Matt recently wrote um, a wonderful, what I think is a wonderful blog post on our, our blog, which is coil.io forward slash blog for those <laughs> interested, um, but about the goals of Dask and something that I didn't quite recognize, which of course now makes so much sense is uh, Matt listed two technical goals. Uh, one was to harness the power of all the cores of workstations in parallel, um, and the other was to support larger than memory computation. But in addition to that, there was a social goal, which was to invent nothing. And I quote that Matt and uh, everyone who created Dask wanted to be as familiar as possible to what users already knew in the Pi data stack. And I think that's really important to recognize that all the things we're talking about are technical challenges, but they're also so socio-cultural challenges. And so having an API, which not only mimics the APIs that we know and love, but also for the most part runs those APIs in, in, in and, and runs the code you're thinking you're writing in the back end, makes it Python data science native. And this is in contrast to distributed computing frameworks such as Spark, which has its own strengths, but it, it, it's a strength of Dask that it's it's native for people already working in the PyData ecosystem. Hugo, I love that in that explanation, you also referred to Coil.io, the website, and the blog. You're like, you're doing the, the cross-marketing pitch. Absolutely. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> and I'll also second the fact that it's a notable accomplishment that you have so far been able to make Dask essentially transparent to people who are trying to build these types of applications and numerical analyses because it's definitely not easy to be able to keep up with the API changes of libraries that you are not primarily responsible for. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, an interesting point is that there is no Dask API, right? We uh, we work with the other communities, you know, NumPy, Pandas, you know, Tornado, Concurrent Futures, every Dask API is a pre-existing API people are already familiar with. So, you know, if you are... In an async IO application, you can, you know, submit futures in the same way you would with an executor, like a thread pool executor, and you can await them with async await, and you can, you know, do all the things you normally do. So Dask is very much like a movement to scale the existing code we all already use, rather than a reinvention of the Python space. So it's very much part of uh, the Python the Python community. And as I mentioned, you were one of the early guests on the Data Engineering Podcast, where we dug fairly deep into Dask itself. But that was about three and a half years ago now. So I'm curious how the project has changed or evolved in that time since we last talked about it. Yeah, I would say uh, technically, it hasn't actually changed a ton. Like Dask has been relatively stable over the last few years. Where we've seen a lot of activity is in the growth of sort of Dask adjacent projects. So this might be in domain-specific applications. So like all the earth scientists made Pangeo, which builds on top of X-Ray, which is a Dask-powered library to do things like, you know, satellite imagery with NASA, climate change, oceanography. And there's, you know, hundreds or thousands of people over there who we've been supporting who all use Dask. Uh, you know, similarly, there's the Rapids effort out of NVIDIA. There's a large effort out of NVIDIA, which is all powered by Dask and CUDA code to provide a GPU accelerated data science. There's other projects like Prefect, uh, which is sort of like a reinvented airflow and lots more. So I think most of what we've been seeing is a lot of growth of people using Dask. And most of the core contributors to Dask are mostly in the sort of service mode. We are serving other communities who are now trying to scale. I think this week, for example, we've actually seen a lot of great growth in the life sciences. So we've seen like biomedical imaging pop up. We've seen population genomics pop up. We've seen you know single cell analysis. So this week I've had you know, two conversations with completely different groups who are both building infrastructure on top of Dask. One example that I love is is NASA. Um, I think they're doing a lot of lot of incredible work. And on top of that, like think about how Dask has changed or evolved in the past three and a half years is also a function of how 
Python has evolved and the increased adoption. I mean, Dave Robinson, when he was at Stack Overflow, wrote that wonderful post, The Incredible Growth of Python, looking at Stack Overflow trends, right? And that was three years ago, but we've been seeing such incredible growth growth since. And I think, you know, Scikit-learn is probably a, a dominant example, but there are so many others across diff- di- different domains. And once again, as Dask is part of the PyData ecosystem, we've seen kind of all these, the entire ecosystem be be lifted up together. The other thing I'll add is with my evangelist hat hat on, I'm just so excited to start servicing more and more of the dask stories that that exist. And I know I'm, it may seem like I'm coming hard and fast with, with salesy pitches, but this actually comes from a, a place of serious excitement. Um, at the moment, it's, it's uh, mid-August 2020, we're running uh, weekly live streams where we have people who use dask come on. Um, so check out our YouTube channel if you want to want to check these out. Last week, we had Alex Egg, um, a senior data scientist at Grubhub, come and talk about how he uses Dask all throughout the productionization of um, search queries and intent recognition using Dask, TensorFlow, Snorkel for weak, weak supervision, and like in using Dask to parallelize so many steps throughout the process. And that's that's really what I'm super excited about at, at the moment. So if you want to check out more of these stories, definitely do come and join us for, for a Science Thursday. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things that I've seen that's notable about the past few years is that the majority of the growth and evolution has been in that surrounding ecosystem and the number of additional libraries that are using Dask as their method for distributing computation rather than Dask taking the forefront. So you mentioned Prefect. I know that Daxter is another project that supports Dask as the execution engine. I would know that I've spoken to a number of people who have been replacing some of their Celery code with the Dask.distributed project for being able to scale out their asynchronous tasks. And also, I think that when we first spoke, the Dask.distributed effort was still fairly nascent. So seeing that become a sort of full-fledged project in its own right as just the execution and uh, distribution method of the code being something that you can use in isolation, I think is definitely noteworthy. Yeah, I was just going to add, and these are only the stories we know as well. It'd be great to, like, Dask and PyData is used through so many companies that we don't have have insight into. So it'd be great to hear from listeners who use Dask about their stories as well. To echo on the the Grubhub example, so we were talking to Alex Egg, and actually during that that stream, Alex imported from Snorkel dot Dask import something, and I was like, "Whoa, wait! Like Snorkel has Dask support? I had no I had no idea that existed." And so that's kind of like the level of penetration we are now, which is which is a fun place to be. After having worked on Dask for the past few years, you have ultimately decided to build a business around it. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about some of the decision points that led you to building that business and some of the motivations and goals that you have for building a company on top of and around Dask? Yeah, no, building a business today on open source software, there's a lot of like interesting variables at play. In terms of motivations, there are several. I mean, first, I wouldn't mind getting some money, but let's you know put that aside for a moment and pretend that I'm, that I'm a nice guy. Yeah, I would say mostly it was that everyone was asking for it. Dask has been really well adopted by individuals and by other open source library authors like we've talked about, but not particularly well adopted by large enterprises. So you look at a company like, let's say, Ford or any sort of large Fortune 50 company, almost certainly there's you know hundreds of people inside the company using Dask, but it's very unlikely that the company as a whole has adopted it. And the same way they would adopt something like Oracle or Spark. To really adopt something like a software at a large institutional level, you really need to buy it from someone. Right? So Ford or NASA don't just adopt open source. They sort of want to buy something. So we need to give them something they could buy from. So we need to have a company for that. Also, we also sort of wanted to lower the barrier for individual users. So they're sort of both serving the very large users, large companies, and also serving individuals. Um, I care very deeply about making computation and data literacy accessible. And you know, scalability is the, the hammer that I use, the hammer that I work on. What we found is that a lot of people could, could use Dask very comfortably on the laptops. And if their workplace happened to have a really nicely set up cluster, maybe they're at a university, they have access to some HPC machine, maybe they have an IT department who understands the cloud and Kubernetes, they were able to use Dask happily at scale. But most people aren't in that situation. Most people were happy using Dask on a laptop, but they didn't really understand the sort of DevOps skills necessary to launch it at scale. 
Yeah, so I might just add, add on top of that. I think you hit the nail on the head se- several times, in particular with all the DevOps that's that's required of, of modern data scientists, particularly whether it be, you know, using Docker and Kubernetes and getting everything up and running on AWS and getting something running locally and moving seamlessly between your local computation and, and the cloud is something which is so challenging these days. Um, Tobias, I, I listened to a recent episode of this podcast with someone from Netflix talking about Metaflow. I mean, we have organiz- large organizations are building things internally to solve these these challenges as well, but not necessarily focused on the PyData ecosystem. So we're essentially making a, a product that makes scaling uh, really easy. And that's what our first product is that uh, we're, we're launching very soon. And so that is mid-August uh, 2020. And it's a Dask in the Cloud service that just tries to be dead simple. Um, our current users show that it's about three to five minutes from opening their beta invitation email to doing computing on the cloud at scale from your laptop and having both environments and data access exactly the same on, on, on your laptop and in the cloud. I'll also add one more thing that we're solving for the end user of, of the data scientist, but we're also solving for institutional cultural uh, challenges. And I'll be more specific. What I mean by that, open source the open source ecosystem solves very well for people wanting to do and needing to do science, right? Data science, scientific research, but it's building out some more collaborative techniques for sure, but it doesn't necessarily, and nor should it solve for institutional culture, cultural challenges. So allowing management to have insight into advanced telemetry uh, so that they can you know, encourage collaboration more um, and, and view costs and see what's happening across their org. Similarly, serving IT's, I, IT's needs. So we check all the boxes from, from IT, from network security or usage controls, um, everything you need in order to analyze your, your, your data uh, safely. And I think part of the value prop is that our team has been doing this for, for, for a long time as well. So productizing that and taking it into organizations that require all these boxes to be ticked. Um, is what we're really excited about, as well as meeting the end needs of uh, the needs of end user data scientists. And I think that the overall push of moving to distributed computation is definitely very evident with the work that you're doing with Dask and the community that's built up around that, and some of the other movers in the ecosystem. I'm thinking in particular about the Ray project and their recent release of the AnyScale company. So I'm wondering if you can just talk a bit more about some of the broader ecosystem changes that are necessitating these distributed capabilities and the ability to run Python code and other computation across large clusters of instances beyond just what's capable of maybe a a laptop or a decently sized server. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a few things going on. One thing is the growth of data, right? We've got all these new data data sets, they're scaling up, uh, and they're becoming arduous to work on on a laptop. Uh, additionally, there's the sort of the rise of machine learning and the use of computation and the, the clear value the company is getting out of computation. And then finally, there's also just a lot of more corporate engagement in Python, right? Previously, you would have done all of this stuff in Java or in Scala. And there's there's sort of a rich ecosystem of tooling in the JVM world, you know, Spark, Hive, Hadoop, et cetera. Uh, as machine learning rises, as technologies like Docker have, have come up and shown that you can run Python in production pretty comfortably, all of that's sort of shifting over to the Python space. And as a result, we need to grow a distributed framework system uh, very quickly. That's the kind of work we've been doing over the last five years, right? Dask maintainers maintain the S3 connections and the GCS connections, and we maintain how to deploy on Yarn and all those sorts of things. So there's... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of business needs. There's a rise of data, and this is a great, there's a great need today. And I'll add, add, add to that. I, I think we, you know, we had the big data hype start a decade ago, or whatever it is now. And value, I think, was delivered clearly in in tech, uh, but not necessarily in a lot of other verticals. And so, I, I think there's been some sort of like, if you view it as the Gartner hype cycle, in some industries we may be in the trough of disillusionment. But I, I do think. There are huge gains to be made with the amount of data we, we have out there, and, but we just don't have the tooling to deal with it. And for data scientists and machine learning engineers and people doing uh, productionizing machine learning to, to deal with it. So I'll use, um, Matt and I are writing an opinionated and, and somewhat provocative post currently that we truly believe in about the fact that uh, all-in-one data platforms serve 
very important purposes in infrastructure and, and data engineering, but currently they don't meet the meet the needs of end user data scientists who need n- nimbleness, uh, flexibility, and ergonomic products that allow them to you know work with the with the bleeding edge packages and moving as we've said before seamlessly between the laptop and the cloud. And I think in terms of actually getting deriving the next level of value from all the data out there, we're going to require these types of products to to be built for data scientists to use to e- extract that value. And that's what we're what we're really excited about as well. I'll also add though that big data or whatever we want to call it isn't always the answer. And if people are like, should I do distributed machine learning? I always say no, unless you you have to. Like plot your learning curves as you increase the size of your data set. And if your accuracy or whatever your you know evaluation metric of, in, of interest plateaus well before you need to go distributed, maybe you don't need much more data. You know, select your, your features uh, accordingly before you go to a, a, a distributed setting. Um, so I think it's key, but it isn't always the, the solution. It's question and data specific. And to the point of the challenges of running things like Dask in production or getting machine learning and data science workloads into a distributed capacity, for people who are using Dask, what are some of the existing sharp edges that you're looking to solve for as a company and just as ongoing maintainers of the Dask library and its ecosystem? Yeah, I would say generally deployment is really hard especially in an enterprise context, and especially for the kind of people who use Dask, who are typically you know, data scientists, analysts, machine learning researchers uh, without a lot of DevOps experience. It's honestly mostly a cultural thing. Like it's actually not, there's no novel thing that needs to be built to solve this problem. It's just how we sort of productionize it. How do we, how do we turn that into sort of a, a very routine operation? Tigo, you have lots of things, thoughts here. Do you have thoughts? One thing springs to mind in particular is that when people try to move between local and the cloud or move to larger data sets, their sense of flow is is broken. And I don't necessarily want to get too, too holistic here, but data scientists do their best work when they in, are in some sort of flow state with their, with their um, environment, with their data, with their stack, with their computation, with their ecosystem. And that's a huge thing that um, PyData has done. It's something that the Tidyverse has done for the R ecosystem uh, uh, as well, I think. But in the countless conversations I've had with people doing distributed computing and needing to jump back and forth between different contexts, it's the context switching, which breaks a flow state, which makes the process arduous and not ergonomic. And it also, um, I think, means everything just takes a lot longer uh, as well. So that's why I always come back to, you know, meeting data scientists where they are. If they want to do the DevOps and they enjoy doing that, that's fine. But for the most part, they want to do what they do best and stay in that flow state of doing data science and, and, and machine learning. And I do think that is a technical and, and cultural challenge, as Matt has said. Yeah. So maybe let's like give a maybe like a maybe an anecdotal example. Let's say that you're using Scikit-Learn and you want you're doing some hyperparameter optimization on random forests and you want to make it run faster because it's taking a while. So you know you you do a web search for Scikit-Learn fast. You find the Scikit-Learn docs. You find they point to Dask. You try using Dask. You use it on a local machine. You're pretty happy. The single core to multi-core on single machine experience, that that transition is really smooth today. A ton of people do that and they're very happy. But then you want to scale to many machines. So you say, hey, great, I got this cloud account. You go to your IT department. You get access to your AWS credentials. You then you know, go on the DAS documentation. You don't know anything about the cloud, but the DAS doc's pretty good. They point you at Kubernetes. You, you know, spend an hour, learn how to Kubernetes works and well enough to stand something up on you know, AKS or something, and then you launch projects like Dask Kubernetes. If you're actually a sharp data science developer, you could probably do that today in about an hour uh, without really knowing much about how Kubernetes works, which is you know, testament to lots of open source projects. After that, you might get it running and you say, actually, you know, it turns out the, the Docker image I'm running remotely doesn't have scikit-learn installed. Well, crap. Like, now I need to go build a Docker image. I need to push that up somewhere. Uh, you try it again. And you know, the Python versions are different because, you know, we're serializing data in some weird way. You fix that again, you push it up again. Magically, it works. It's been a couple of days, but you're you're working now. You're really happy. A month later, IT knocks and says, hey, wait a minute, you left that machine up for a long time. You racked up around $10,000. And there's no security on that machine. And so, you know, fortunately, no one found the address you were using. But, you know, you actually had, ac- you had credentials that you copied on that machine that were totally open to, to everyone in the world. And so you've been sort of locked down by IT now. So those are the, that's sort of a, a brief narrative, the kinds of things that a you know, data scientist runs into if they're actually really sharp and are able to jump past all those hurdles. But it's, it's just the pain, right? And it's not something that most people do. 
I couldn't agree more. And I, I think one thing you've done wonderfully in there, Matt, is also help us reason about uh, distributed data work and, and machine learning. I'll, I'll pull out one example. There are lots in, in, in there with respect to the processes that, that are necessary. But um, I think it was maybe Travis Oliphant, who I heard this from the first time, that distinct, even distinguishing scaling up to multiple cores in a single workstation, as opposed to scaling out to a variety of clusters or on the cloud or on, on prem or w- w- whatever you're doing, and thinking constructively and reasoning about these processes and what you need to do. Because maybe for the work you need to do, you only need to scale up, right, to uh, multiple cores on, on your local work, workstation. But then um, what, what are the next steps? And that, that will be scaling out. So I, I think that framework's very instructive. And so in order to overcome some of these challenges and the complexities of building these distributed computation platforms and managing all of the different security implications and the scaling implications and the operational aspects of running code in production, what are you working on building at Coiled to help alleviate some of those pain points? Essentially, the first iteration of our product are hosted and scalable DAS clusters so that you can use Coiled Cloud to launch clusters on managed resources like the cloud with a single click. Certain things we handle really well are deploying containers, hooking up networking securely, uh, and making it easy to connect. So you as a data scientist can get back to your real work and, uh, and, and do what you do best. As we stated earlier, part of the value proposition is we don't want you to have to wait on, on, on DevOps or having data scientists have to do all the DevOps th- themselves. So you can use clusters of machines, advanced libraries, and GPUs. Um, Cloud works anywhere. Uh, so currently, including cloud services like AWS SageMaker, open source solutions like JupyterHub, or even from the comfort of your own laptop. This includes... I think, as we hinted at it earlier, manage software environments uh, with Conda or PIP and Docker, user management, uh, advanced telemetry, cost controls, uh, these types of things, and everything that you'd that your IT team uh, would be would be interested in as well with respect to auth and security. Yeah, maybe I'll add to that because this is a Python podcast, and because people actually on the podcast know what we're know what we're doing, they can sort of appreciate this both from a user perspective and from an internal dev perspective. I'll tell you a little bit about how Coil is engineered internally. Awesome. So Coil combines uh, it's a Django web app, it's Postgres, it's Amazon ECS, and Conda. Those are mostly the the tools that we're throwing together and Dask. And so Coil is a Django app that you can authenticate into that will launch on demand DAS clusters on Amazon ECS. ECS is like a container service. It's like Kubernetes. It's a bit simpler, a bit more widely available. So you can log into Coiled, tell Coiled, hey, create a DAS cluster for me somewhere, and it'll do that. And that's that's step one, right? You then want to tell that DAS cluster, hey, you need to have these libraries installed. And so Coiled handles building software environments. Most data scientists don't like using Docker, so we solve Condor or PIP environments for you. We hold on to those, we store those, we build Docker images for you, and we deploy them. We handle things like authentication with the cloud. So you may, on your laptop, have credentials to Amazon. We're going to take those credentials, generate some secure tokens, ship those up to those workers as well, so they can operate as you. All of that's done securely, so you can drive that cluster of machines on AWS from your laptop or from you know some Circle CI script or from you know some... GUI application running Python. So Coil is designed to solve the Dask deployment problem and the sort of like peripheral problems just around that problem, software management, cost management, et cetera. Then we also, because we're watching everything you do, because we're watching how big you're scaling that thing up, we're we're a good place to impose limits, right? You know, maybe you manage a team, you are swiping a credit card so people can use that and you can give people access to that up to a certain amount. You can gate their access. You can say, hey, this guy can or cannot use GPUs. This person's really good. She can use you know, $100 an hour of clusters if she wants to. And so that's it's all that sort of basic functionality around managing Dask. And yeah, it's built with a bunch of actually like really boring technologies that have been around for a decade, but it's really comfortable. Like as someone who uses Dask a ton, I've used Dask in every single possible situation you can imagine it. We built the way that I prefer using Dask and I, I love it. It's actually really, it's really comfortable. It's really pleasant. It's really easy. Yeah, that's an ask. That's coiled. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to be said for boring technologies because it's definitely interesting and exciting to be able to use bleeding edge new platforms or projects. But when you actually go to production with something, you want it to be boring because you don't want it to wake you up in the middle of the night every day for the next 10 weeks. Yeah, this actually I have actually never used Django before. I've been in Python for you know, a decade plus. And I've always been on the data science side. It's actually really fun for me to interact more with the website of Python. The people we have who, who are employed at Coil, the engineers, uh, people like Rami or Dan or Marcos, 
all like understand this stack super well. And it's like, hey, can we like, how hard is it to add, you know, GitHub authentication? And I'm like, sure, it takes a day because there's like the Django all off package. This is probably really boring to most of your listeners. But for me, it's like I just discovered this new set of superpowers that we have. Like all the Django plugins are, it's great. It's like finding, you know, visualization libraries in the data science side for the first time. Yeah, it's definitely interesting how the breadth of the Python ecosystem can lead you to be somebody who has worked in the overall language for, you know, a decade plus, and then still have some area of the community that is completely new to you that has all of these exciting new shiny bells and whistles that everybody else has considered old hat for the past five years. It's also why building a product like this is super easy, right? We happen to have this amazing distributed computing stack and this amazing web stack and connections to everything. Uh, the fact that everything is available in the same language makes you know cobbling these things together just really amazing. It's great. Continuing on the thread of Python, the main tagline that you have on your website right now is focused on the fact that you're scaling Python, which is in some sense for somebody who's using Python, oh, this is great. But for somebody who is concerned primarily with just, I have this data problem, it might not necessarily be a, a trigger for them to say, oh, this is what I need. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on the pros and cons of orienting your messaging on that aspect of the scalability of Python, as opposed to focusing on a particular problem domain or industry. Yeah, super interesting question. Uh, first, actually, like scaling Python right now is actually like hitting pretty well in the market. Uh, a lot of companies are building up their Python stack or they're scaling their Python stack and they're looking for solutions. So it's actually a pretty good time to try to sell that messaging. But more generally, I think you bring up a good point that it's actually really tricky to sell something that's so broad, right? So you know, if we go to the other extreme, for example, if we were selling a product that you know identified tumors in images to save lives in hospitals, or you know, a biofuel that increased fuel efficiency by 20%, like the, the value of those propositions is much clearer. It's much more easy and direct to sell. It's like, yep, I'm going to save 20%. Makes sense to buy. Here's 10%. Transaction done. Scaling Python is a lot more, it's a lot more broad. It's a lot more indirect, right? You don't have to like get into a conversation with a customer about, okay, well, like, why do you care about data science? Why is that useful to you? Do you care about reducing cloud costs? Like how how is it that making your people more efficient will actually save you money in the future? And so it's a much longer conversation to uh, to get to that point where they say, yes, this makes sense. We're going to invest you know, a large chunk of money uh, to purchase your product. Uh, but on the other hand, it's super broad. And that's really, I think, where open source companies really shine. We can sell to, you know, to NASA, who wants to care about satellite imagery. And then we can turn around and sell to you know, Pfizer or some pharma company who cares about biomedical imaging. And it turns out that biomedical imaging and satellite imagery are actually kind of the same problem. So it's uh, it's tricky. You have to really start to understand your customers and get a lot more empathy with people. Uh, but there's a ton of opportunity, which is fun. It's just like a very big puzzle to solve. I, I agree. I agree with all of that. And I take a, I have a slightly different perspective. I think it's a great question as well. And this is something that is not boring and does wake me up at night uh, for, for clarity. But <laughs> we need to think about what our job is at Coil. We've got lots of jobs at Coiled currently, but is our job to sell the pro product as much as possible or at this early stage to build the best product possible? And I think it's it's definitely the latter. And to, to that end, we don't necessarily want to be positioning ourselves as, as solving industry-specific problems. We want to get data science teams on board to use our product and to form kind of an Iterate, a rapid iterative feedback loop into, into product development, right? So it's essentially, in that sense, uh, a bottom-up motion and a grassroots uh, movement of, of data scientists built into the product development cycle and, and solving their pain points. And of course, as you state, if it, later on it becomes industry-specific, we may even move to you know a, a top-down sales motion a la you know, Databricks and th this type of stuff. I'm not saying that we will we will do that, but these are kind of a wide range of questions where we're thinking about. It's interesting coming onto a programming podcast and talking about sales motions and um, and you know, sales strategies. But it's actually it's kind of interesting in this perspective because this is one of those cases where I think the the profitable thing and the like community thing happen to be aligned. So we're going to make most of our money selling to big companies, right? Yeah, you know, Ford, NASA, whatever are going to buy something for millions of dollars. But those can take a long time. In the meantime, 
Like we have a bunch of users who we can learn a lot about and who we can who can iterate with very quickly. And so we're both selling you know, these big things that take years to close with big companies. But in the meantime, we're, we're making a product that's really designed for individuals to use. Because uh, I think we're going to get a lot of information about how people want to scale their Python code. And so for the next year or so, we're really just focusing on making the sort of public access product as ergonomic and as friendly as possible. And that happens to align very well with you know, what I care about altruistically of you know, increasing access, increasing our society's ability to reason about uh, the world through data. And so it's, again, one of those things where I think making money and helping the world end up being kind of the same actions. And it's also aligned with increasing adoption of the tools that we believe do good in, in the world as well, and that we build to do good in in the world. So if we can build a product that grows the Dask and Pi data Pi as large as possible for people who find it at valuable, and I think that's amazing. And of course, there are a lot of nuances here to make sure that these incentives are aligned, but that's that's the goal. And I know Matt is, and I'm definitely excited to be part of, of this movement of garnering even more OSS uh, institutional adoption through commercial products as well. This portion of podcast.init is brought to you by Datadog. Do you have an app in production that is slower than you like? Is its performance all over the place, sometimes fast and sometimes slow? Do you know why? With Datadog, you will. You can troubleshoot your app's performance with Datadog's end-to-end -end tracing, and in one click, correlate those Python traces with related logs and metrics. Use their detailed flame graphs to identify bottlenecks and latency in that app of yours. Start tracking the performance of your apps with a free trial at pythonpodcast.com slash datadog. If you sign up for a trial and install the agent, Datadog will send you a free t-shirt to keep you comfortable while you keep track of your apps. And continuing on that topic of the dichotomy of open source and commercial product, I'm wondering what you have seen so far as the challenges in being able to manage those competing tensions between the open source work that you do and working as maintainers and core contributors of the Dask project, as well as this proprietary stack that you're building around it and working on selling to companies to help drive the overall business forward, as well as trying to help support the open open source ecosystem around it. I have tons of thoughts on that topic. That's like a whole podcast. Uh, before I go off into things, Hugo, do you have thoughts? I, I do, but I I will defer to you because I, I think in you're actually in a very different position to me with your, with your role in terms of being a core contributor and a maintainer of a package as well as building a product around that package. I, okay, having said that, my position, it's very interesting. I mean, <laughs> I, I run, I'm, I'm head of data science evangelism on one side and marketing on, on another. So I joke that I sometimes feel like Two-Face from, from Batman. I'm a good guy though, in, in, in terms of, I have an enterprise face with respect to marketing, but an evangelism face with re respect to community development. And I, I, I feel like the role of Coiled and the role of myself in, in, in these positions is to form connective tissue between both that creates value that's more than the sum of it, some of its parts. So I know, I know this is very abstract, but ideally the work that the open source community puts in, they get more out of and similarly with the enterprise. And I think the direction from OSS to the enterprise is what we've been talking about, but the other direction is, is incredibly important as well. And I hinted at that with respect to garnering further adoption of, of open source, but also um, thinking about viable models for, for funding open source and for employing open source developers. And I mean, we're both very excited to be part of a, a fascinating lineage here. And, you know, they've been companies for several decades now that have learned learned lessons lessons here that we're we're in close 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 connection with and that you know Matt Matt has worked for, for for example so I think that's that's my take but I'm even more interested in Matt's take um, due to his unique position yeah I think I like your two face example I'll say maybe many hats is the word term that I would use um, it doesn't turn you into a superhero uh, villain at least which I think I'm sure there's a superhero villain somewhere with yeah, lots of hats uh, the mad hatter I like that how about that but yeah I mean we've actually been kind of threading this needle with Dask since its inception, right? Dask came out of a for-profit company. It came out of Anaconda, right? Anaconda was amazing in its support for Dask early on. And it hired you know me and lots of other people to work on Dask over time. And we had to sort of be very aware of when we were being Anacondans and when we were being open source Python people. I then moved to NVIDIA and I had the same challenges with GPUs. And so, yeah, we've always had those sorts of challenges. I think it's now maybe like up another level. Like I now get 
like direct compensation based on how well certain things do with Dask. So we need to be careful. But it's it's a care it's something that we're we're used to doing. I think you know, for example, as an anecdote, a very small anecdote. Uh, Hugo asked me, I think just yesterday, you know, hey, we're doing all these community blog posts about people who use Dask. Can we get the Dask Twitter account to retweet uh, the coiled content? And I said, like, yeah, sure, that sounds great, but like, I can't do that, right? That would be a conflict of interest. Go find someone else who who also manages the Dask Twitter account and have them uh, retweet that for you. You've got to work that out with them independently of me. So that's been, you know, it's something we always deal with. Go ahead. I was just going to say, with respect to that example, I was fascinated that uh, the Dask developer community had already thought about this. And you linked me to a, a GitHub issue in which it had been discussed and there was already a path somewhat laid out, laid out for this. And I think that what that flags for me is that, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of these concerns have kind of almost been preempted in, in, in some sense. And it's about figuring out a, a seamless way to get these flows flows happening. But the open source development community is an incredibly um, intelligent, thoughtful, empathetic bunch of people for, 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 the, for the most part. <laughs> That's not entirely true, always. But, I, I agree. And I'm just thinking about Stack Overflow <laughs> responses now, actually. What I would say, maybe in, in Dask's favor, uh, we have a lot of practice at this. And Dask is actually really well well positioned to handle this sort of challenge because we already have a bunch of companies that are involved in Dask, right? We have you know, weekly maintainer calls every Tuesday morning. There's got to be people at six or seven different companies who attend those calls. Uh, it's not a lot of open source companies. They're at mega company first. They release some open source software and they maintain that software as part of their company. If the company fails, the software goes under and probably everyone in that software, everyone who has commit rights to that software probably works for that company. Super common model. That's definitely not the Dask model, right? Dask operates much more like Pandas or NumPy or Jupyter. It's very much a multi-institution endeavor. It's not attached to one particular company. And that gives Dask a lot of its strength, a lot of its perspective, and a lot of its resilience. Another interesting element of the fact that you are starting Coiled at this particular point in time is that we're in the middle of a global pandemic, and I'm sure that that has added some additional complicating factors to what is already a stressful time. So I'm wondering if you can maybe talk a bit about some of the ways that that has manifested in your current journey of launching this company and building a business at the particular point of the world. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was great. Great timing in various ways. Uh, I think the company was incorporated, I want to say like February 11th. So like, you know, a few weeks before the world ended. Uh, mostly it's actually been fine. Um, I think it's like some of our like intended anchor clients, uh, like step back, said, wait, we're going to wait until things, uh, you know, settle down a little bit. They're now coming back. So there's definitely early clients that left, but there's actually a lot of churn right now in lots of ways, which is really fascinating. Hiring is super interesting right now, right? A lot of people came on the market. They were then scooped up very quickly. There was a lot of sort of activity. Uh, we are, we're a remote first company. We, Dask has always been remote first, so Coiled is too, uh, which has been great in some ways, although I've been stressed in some other ways. Um, I'll let Hugo maybe talk about that for a moment. Yeah, I do think that it's interesting that we were already intending to build a uh, 100% remote uh, company already, or as I like to joke, because we're in the distributed uh, computing space, 100% uh, distributed company. <laughs> um, all, all that I'm saying there essentially is that a lot of the challenges we're facing due to that aspect of everything that's happening at the moment, uh, we were we were preparing to, to, to face anyway. I do think one of the biggest stresses is the fact that I'm currently in Australia. So for context, I'm from Australia. Uh, I've lived in the US for six years and I was planning to, to still work in, in, in the US, but I'm currently waiting for US consulates to reopen for uh, visa, visa processing for me to get back on, on American soil. So the biggest stress currently is trying to build a company from seed stage on opposite sides of the world. There are a few wins that, that can happen with respect to these obscene time zone differences. I think the biggest one being that we can hand off uh, stuff to each other at the end of my day uh, and vice versa. And then when I get up, uh, Matt or whoever else has, has, has worked a lot on it and, and I can move on that. But in terms of um, syncing on, on a variety of things and being in the same headspace uh, and, and at the same time of day, there are a lot of kind of uh, daily um, challenges that arise uh, because of that. But it's something we're thinking about actively and, and working on actively. And we're excited to find solutions as well. 
Yeah, I'd say as as all of us have learned, I think COVID kind of killed working hours. They killed the workday. It's a it's a mishmash today. Uh, but there's also lots of great opportunities. Like companies are kind of in a state of reinvention right now. And, you know, they're looking for new things. It's actually like, I would say sales interest has not dropped off significantly. And on top of the challenges of building a business and doing it during pandemic times, you're also building it on top of open source, which we've touched on a little bit as far as some of the challenges there. But what are some of the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned in the process of building and launching a company that is oriented around an open source platform? Yeah, I would say the biggest, the biggest, and not really a surprise, but maybe reinforced pre-existing uh, biases was that nobody has any idea how to do this well yet. There are a ton of models of successful companies. You know, there's the Red Hat model, there's you know Mongo and Confluent, there's Databricks, something totally different. There's Anaconda in the Python space, but they're all very different paths. But none of them are worn very well. It's all a challenge. Uh, you know, for example, we're currently working through you know contracts and legal with like five giant companies each of whom have their own legal teams. You know, and we have like our amazing legal rep part-time that we that we engage. Uh, but none of those companies has any idea how to deal with open source software in any sort of reasonable manner. You know, IP issues, it's all it's all a pain. So step by step, it feels very much like an uphill battle through relatively rough terrain. On the grand scheme of it, though, it's also great. Like there's an incredible amount of support. It's surprising how many people know us know the DAS project and just genuinely want to see us succeed. It's very heartwarming to see the the support. And I think you get that being in an open source company. Yeah, I, I think Matt hit several nails on their respective heads um, a, a bunch of times there. I'll just add that there are a lot of people who who we really enjoy working with building similar uh, similar companies uh, uh, at the moment um, and that we're really excited to be part of a community uh, of people figuring this out um, and a handful that that come immediately to mind from from friends and family uh, Travis Oliphant and all the wonderful people he, he works with at, at Quonsite and then Wes McKinney at, at Ursa Lab and then Peter Wang and the entire team there at, at Anaconda uh, as well so there are a lot of challenges to, to figure out, um, but there are a lot of wonderful, uh, incredible people who we're excited to work with closely on, on all of these things. And as you build out more of the coiled business and continue on the path of bringing Dask to more users, what are some of the things that you have planned for the future of both the coiled company and the Dask project? On, on the Dask side, I would say just keep it expanding. Right. There's a ton of new users, there's a ton of use cases, and we're just going to grow that to new scientific domains, new industry verticals. And that's that's the focus, I think. That's where we're seeing the most activity, and it's super exciting right now. And on the coiled side, we are just super excited to be building a product that is dead simple to use uh, f for data scientists uh, and anybody who, who needs to do data science and, and or machine learning at scale. Um, so, as a call to action, if you're doing data science and or machine learning at scale and you love to break things, we'd really like for you to take Coiled for a test drive uh, by signing up for our beta. And you can do so uh, at bit.ly slash coiled hyphen beta. Uh, and we're looking for feedback and conversations and, and all of these things to build uh, as, as good a product as we can. Are there any other aspects of the work that you're doing on Dask or at Coiled or just the overall space of machine learning and data science and helping them scale that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? There are hundreds of such topics. So I'll just I'll just hold those in my pocket for next time, Tobias. All right. Well, you're welcome back anytime you like. So for anybody who does want to follow along with either of you and keep in touch, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And so with that, I'll move us into the picks. And this week, I'm going to choose the book The Hobbit. I've read it a few times and just recently started revisiting that in audiobook form with my kids. So definitely recommend uh, giving that one another look or a first look if you've never read it before. Uh, definitely just a great story and a lot of good fun and just a good adventure. So uh, with that, I'll pass it to you, Matt. Do you have any picks this week? Sure. One of the DAS maintainers, uh, Jim Chris, just moved to the, the Prefect company. So I'll maybe in honor of him. So let's so say Prefect. I think you might have done a, a an episode with the Prefect founder on your other podcast, Data Engineering Podcast. Yes, I did. I'll add a link to that. So that, I mean, if you if you like Airflow and you think Airflow is a great tool, uh, you might find the Prefect is, is an even greater tool. Uh, it also happens to be DAS powered. So it's a little, uh, little self-serving. And Hugo, do you have any picks this week? 
Yeah, man. I'm actually, I'm currently rereading a book that I read late last year that impacted me a, a great deal. It's called Race After Technology by Ruha Benjamin, who has been since then a, a constant source of inspiration to me. Uh, Ruha is an associate professor of African-American studies at Princeton University. And Race After Technology uh, delves essentially into the co-evolution of both race and technology and not only how they impact one another but how actually they're so coupled and and, and they co-evolve and what Ruha does in this book is provides an in-depth critique and analysis of a lot of the at scale algorithms that are harming already disenfranchised people uh in, in particular the, the racist structures that are emerging but she also gives us a very serious language to start describing th the things we're seeing so the one in particular is what she refers to as the new gym code and i'm going to read a, a, just a small part of, of, of what she describes as the new gym code which is the employment of new technologies that reflect and reproduce existing iniquities but that are promoted and perceived as more objective or progressive than the discriminatory systems of a previous era, okay? Uh, so Ruha does a, an incredible job um, at allowing us to perceive what's happening by building a language and structure around it. She also had a fascinating keynote recently at ICLR, which I encourage everyone to check out, uh, where she makes clear um, such things as, you know, when we talk about uh, deep learning and think, you know, how how powerful it is, but she makes clear, she says, for example, that computational depth in deep learning, for example, without sociological, sociological depth is actually superficial learning. So I encourage everyone to check out the book Race After Technology uh, and her talk, uh, her keynote, which I'll link to in the show notes. All right. Uh, well, thank you both for taking the time to join me today and discuss the work that you've been doing with Dask and building Coiled as a business around that. Uh, Dask is a project that I've been keeping a close eye on for a number of years now. And so I appreciate all of the time and energy that you each put into the open source work and the business that you're building on top of it. I look forward to seeing where it takes you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, you too, Spias. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out our other show, The Data Engineering Podcast, at dataengineeringpodcast.com for the latest on modern data management. And visit the site at pythonpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at podcastinit.com with your story. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends and coworkers.